What's going on? Welcome to the Honest Youth Pastor YouTube channel, the channel that helps believers use biblical discernment in all aspects of life. Tonight, you are here for the Tuesday night live stream, or perhaps uh, the replay. We're going to be talking about uh, the Asbury thing. I don't know what you want to call it, but as normal, we have Josh and Matt. Welcome, guy. Ah, whoa, my chair is breaking. Sorry. That was Easy. dramatic. Man, I tell you what. All right, so welcome tonight, guys. Welcome. As I, as we've already kind of discussed, we'll we'll be discussing Asbury a little bit. Those are you're gonna hear my dogs fight in the background. I'm sorry. Uh, high value productions here. This is this is we yeah. only produce the best live streams. So we're gonna be talking about Asbury a little bit, but really more in general. I mean, I don't want to spend the whole the whole live stream on that, but I would like to pick your guys' brains and then kind of move on to. Um, more of like implications for the wider church and how we approach um, events like this or how we approach, you know, just moves of God within local congregations and whatnot. So I, I think if you guys are, that are watching don't know my opinion on it, I did an entire video yesterday. Um, but before I give mine, Josh, Matt, who wants to go first? Matt, you're like super close. Well, you're in Kentucky. So would you like to go first on your opinions or just what you've heard on the whole thing in general? Sure. So I had intended to go and specifically to go at the same time as Michael did. However, uh, I have uh, several things impinging upon my uh, schedule. Responsibilities. For- you have responsibilities. Yeah, so I, I was I was predisposed uh, at the date of Michael's arrival, uh, so I sadly did not get to go. Uh, but Asbury is actually only about oh, it's about two hours away from me, just like it is from you. Not my bad, uh, Yeah, I know. So so I sort of feel uh, sort of like um, a hypocrite in certain ways because there's people from all over the nation who are like buying plane tickets and driving overnight to get there and then driving back the next night without sleep to get home. And here, here I am just an afternoon drives away and I never, I never made the effort to go. I mean, I wanted to, my, my heart was there, my attention was there. Uh, but I grew up in Pentecostal holiness, charismatic circles where Revival was essentially the, you could almost say like the practical and anticipatory focus at all times. It was like, no matter what was going on, we need, we need a revival. We need, and it's not necessarily they would say we need another revival. They would just say we just need a revival. And so it was always this hype that was building up between these anticipations for revival. So, as I grew older, and not to say that my tradition is explicitly immature, but just as, as I matured a little bit spiritually, I got tired of living off of those emotional experiential highs between revivals. And I can, I can honestly say that and none of these are just our introductory statements. So I apologize for growing it all. But anyways, just, just I'll try to condense it here. Um, so I guess I got a little bit burned out uh, just, just from experience because I realized that even though those revivals had their place and I got like some kind of emotional hype, and, and I think that God can and does and will use emotion. He's the one who gave us emotions, and sometimes God can even work through emotionalism, even if at the end of the journey it's to mature out of emotionalism. Um, But yeah, I just got kind of burned out. Um, I don't think I'm really as cynical as Michael is, uh, you know, on on most things. I'm like, who is as cynical as Michael on most things, right? No one. Uh, I am the top. I, I am open to these sorts of things, but I know from experience that they can be good. So that's kind of sort of like my, my, my introductory remark. They, they can be good. Cool. 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 So Josh, you kind of gave a look like you are, you're, you're vying for the most <laughs> cynical person on the block over here. Let me know what are your thoughts on the whole thing? I, I mean, so, you know, I was raised in a Baptist tradition and I mean, Bro, we're skeptical of ethanol cars, like skeptical of everything and anything. 
right? And that was, uh, to be honest, that was my initial reaction. It was like, you know, I, I kind of heard the rumblings, uh, there's a revival, and I'm just kind of like, yeah, okay, whatever. I'm going to keep doing whatever it is that I'm doing. And then you keep hearing more and more and more, and then, you know, my it's all over all of my feeds. Uh, and so I was kind of confronted and had to think about it to the best of my ability uh, without having been there. And I live a little bit further away than, than Matt, so I... I don't have the money to afford a ticket, so. Yeah, I saw bit. people there. They're like, "Hey, is Josh coming?" I'm like, "Ah, Josh is a little bit further away. I don't think Josh <laughs> will be here." Oh, that's cool. They know who I am. What? What? Um, yeah, from the live cool. stream. Yeah, somebody asked about you. Oh, cool. All right. Um, so, anyways, that was my initial reaction, but uh, thankfully, much like Matt, I've I've grown, and it, it was it's kind of a different experience. So, right, instead of like from revival to revival, it was almost like the opposite. Uh, not opposite, but a different kind of growth, uh, moving away from being completely skeptical of absolutely everything all the time and say, well, maybe the Lord is God and can work through all of these different things, like Matt said, right? So it's it's always fun approaching things with Matt because he and I had such different doctrinal backgrounds in the way that we grew up, but we've landed in a lot of some, some very similar places theologically you know, not in dispensationalism though. I was just waiting for it. I was just waiting for it. <laughs> a few significant differences that uh, we're okay with. You know, it's the degree to disagree. It's a lot of love. You know, love covers a multitude of sins. I love Matt. You know, so. <laughs> Got it. Cool, cool. So if you guys, uh, like I said, I've already sent a video out on if you want to, obviously it's going to take an hour of your day, but a really short kind of summary of mine is that I, I think I kind of grew up maybe in between you guys in regards to Wesleyans are very holiness driven, very about revival. I heard about revival, like I said, in some, some posts that I made. We had a revival every single year, maybe twice a year. And what revival went for me growing up, though, was it's just church at night with a different speaker and probably different singers. Mm. And so that was revival for me. That's all it was. It was just a different sort of trying to stir you up. And then they do an altar call every single night. So it was basically like a uh, student camp yeah. for adults, essentially yep. student camp for adults. Yep. And so only like with less emotion, it was just more mm, faces. So, um, that was sort of, I mean, so as I mentioned, some of the posts, I'm just, I was really, really skeptical, um, just because that's what it is. Plus the videos I had seen, uh, were very much more, uh, well, they were all the singing ones essentially. And it was very charismatic ish. And I'm very skeptical of that. Just, by nature of the things I've interacted with. And so I thought like Matt, I was like, well, I'm not that far away. I could probably maybe get that far. And so I worked out a time uh, to where, you know, everything was going to work out with all the family stuff we had going to where I could kind of section off a night and go. And again, you can watch that video. Long story short, I'm sure we'll talk about it a little bit here. I was pleasantly surprised. I mean, there were definitely some things uh, if you don't want to spend an entire hour, that's cool. There were some things that I af I did have concerns about for sure, but overall, I think uh, it was a very uh, encouraging experience in regards to sort of. I mean, so just to tap into what you guys were talking about, as far as you have differences, but you love each. Other. I mean, you're brothers in Christ, and that was very much the vibe um, that was there. It was very much a. There were there were complete strangers praying for each other. There were people that were giving uh, each other their their blankets or their hat. I mean, they, it was just a it was something you don't see outside of Christian fellowship um, that was happening there. It was just really interesting. So that being said, I just want to get our first initial ideas here, just so can obviously it's a big topic. What's going on? Um, so as we segue into sort of just the reaction of the church in general and kind of personal revival and what that means for the local church. I did want to pick your guys' brains about this. I don't know if you know about it or not, but I'll just kind of... So they are sort of kind of, uh, kind of ending it, essentially. So what I mean by that is they're moving it off of the campus. Uh, the students, I, the student and the youth pastor I talked to that night when I was there, as long as a couple other media reports have confirmed it, that they're basically... Today, or no, last night was the like last, I guess, official one. And there's still some smaller ones where they're kind of fading it out off of the campus onto a uh, location 
off of Asbury's campus because they just can't take that many people. Uh, the youth mm-hmm. pastor was like, the example he gave that I talked to, he's like, try imagining trying to study and get a decent night of sleep and knowing you have tests and assignments coming and there are thousands of people outside your dorm room making a ruckus and you just, you can't get rest, there's no peace and there's just too much happening where you can't study. So the university was trying to figure out how can we keep this, whatever this is going and provide a space for it, but yet still, you know, get some sort of normalcy back for the students so they can do their activities while also, you know, participating if they want to. So what I I bring this up for this point for all I've read online is a bunch of uh, critic critical opinions about it. And if it was a real revival, they wouldn't have to put an official into it and move it somewhere else. So I know we all come from different backgrounds. What's your take on just that statement? I mean, um, is, if it is, it, is it not a real revival because you have to move it somewhere else and go back to quote unquote normal life, or it could, it still be something incredibly special where you're just obviously still trying to co do both of those things. What, what do you think, Matt, coming from a more Pentecostal background? Uh, yeah, we had a phrase that uh, that we would use in the midst of, of spontaneous revivals, uh, which actually did not happen extremely often. There was actually probably more scheduled revivals than there were spontaneous. But people would say things like, uh, we'll keep going until the Lord's through with us. And that's sort of like an Appalachian, an Appalachian phrase. And so um, it would just be one of those things where they would continue going as long as there was a kind of momentum and desire in the people. And I think a lot of it also had to do with maybe the the potential (laughs) or the the energy of the the pastoral staff or just the congregation in general. So, um, no, I don't think that there is necessarily anything explicitly wrong with trying to bring it to an end, especially in their situation where they have so many other factors uh, and logistics that fit into this with it being a university and the fact that it had continued consistently for so long. Uh, But I I definitely think they're, they're doing the right thing in, in trying to say, Hey, this can be continued, but just over here. Gotcha. Josh, thoughts? So, I mean, I've seen a lot of the criticism as well, right? I've seen more criticism than support for it, to be honest. And, you know, that just that phrase, it's not a real revival unless, well, what's a real revival? Like, what's the criteria? What's the standard? And that's kind of a popular phrase online, right? Anytime you're talking with atheists or agnostics or just whatever, right? So by what standard? By what standard do we measure a revival? Because in my in my world, you know, my my realm or world that, that I exist in, in my my social circles and church circles, revival is not a common thing, if at all. I, I mean, I've never been to a revival service. Um, so what's the criteria? How do we know if it's real? Right. And I suppose that is a part of the attempt of skepticism to see what's really going on, to see whether or not it's real. But what's the standard of real for a revival? Like, I don't know what it is. Um, and maybe that's part of the conversation ongoing with some of the things that we like and some of the concerns we have, but we've got to come to some sort of an understanding and agreement on what real revival means. Um, and yeah, I don't know that we've got, we've you, got to figure out what real really means. Like, what is that? And by yeah. what standard? Well, the frozen chosen don't typically catch fire from the Holy Spirit, right? That's kind of the idea. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. So let's move on from that. So, so that's sort of a prepper, right? So everybody's got uh, Asbury, uh, at least in their feeds. Everybody's heard about it. Everybody's got an opinion about it. The reality is, though, whether like people liked it or hated it or thought it was real or thought it wasn't real or it really makes no difference in regards to sort of the effects that come after it. I mean, the reality is everybody's kind of talked about it for a while and kind of put their opinions out there. And I mean, most people, not everyone, but everybody kind of knows where everybody falls on it generally by denomination. Um, So the real question is then like, what, what wider effect do, does this have on the church? Because I've had a lot of conversations with people. And again, I'm sure this is going to vary by denomination for sure. And theological background and all of that. But I've had a lot of conversations with people that are like, well, why, 
um, you know, why does it just have to stay there? And by th- it have to stay there, they mean really, I think the conversation is to frame that terminology. <laughs> the people I've talked to are really talking more about not like this continuous, you know, worship or whatever, but really more of this idea of like, why can't, you know, why, do, why haven't we set up a week long prayer time or why haven't we, you know, um, why, why this, why that, right? Why, why aren't we pursuing God in maybe, maybe not exactly that identical way, but like, what are we doing to actually, um, to sort of pray for our community and pray for those around us? Because I think at least in the, the people I've talked to and the conversation I directly had with somebody is that like, really what you see there, again, it's going to look different by denomination, by church, but what you really see there are people just praising God. There's going to be a lot of people that disagree with that, but the idea is just seeking after God and saying, you know, Lord, we, we, you know, we just want to be reminded of your grace. Um, we want to, and again, I know a lot of people didn't see this or haven't talked to people that are there, but you know, people that are, your church is going before and just repenting of sin, of, of being humbled, uh, by the grace of God for praying for each other and their communities. Um, what effects or, or if any, do you guys, you know, have you had conversations about, or do you think maybe this will have on the church altogether, Matt? Yeah, so I think that the intentionality behind the usage of the word wood Bible in any context is the idea of a tangible experience in which your desire for God as an individual and as a church is either reignited or stimulated with the hopes that it grows and it abounds. So in the life of an individual who will say has been feeling particularly depressed, maybe the idea of a personal revival is for them to be encouraged and to be exhorted and then they move forward from that place with a new mentality or a new outlook or even just a new um a new vigor just for endurance like not this emotionally like oh hey you know everything is going to be all right like this toxic positivity but it can actually be a solidified you know, solidified of your resoluteness that i'm going to continue to preserve because um, I just I feel I feel refreshed, and I think that in terms of a community of faith, a local church, perhaps that is seen in a, um, in a revival of maybe exuberance in preaching of the word and in worship, a um, a renewed desire to be active in the community to reach the lost, to be obedient to God in his word and in the commission. And maybe just like just, just a, a reminder of things. And as a reminder, it reminds me also of the various places in Revelation where Jesus is talking to the churches and the majority of them, he has something negative to say about it. He provides a warning, like, you know, remember the works that you did at first and go and do them. Return to your first love. And so I think that the evangelical or charismatic, whatever idea behind a revival is a specific time that is presented to a people in which they can do them. They can, you know, remember and do their first works that their their first that they return to their first love in and through this specific time and and experience. I don't have a problem with using the, the word experience, even it's not just a Pentecostal charismatic, but even a Wesleyan thing that's sort of uh, part of the the Wesleyan quadrilateral, even though that John Wesley didn't use that word. But one of those is is experience. You know, you have you have scripture, you have tradition, you have reason, and you have experience in though in that order. And so um, I think we're looking at a revival that if it is a revival and people are doing it scripturally and it's adhering to the traditions of the church and there's nothing unreasonable about it, 
then that experience is essentially valid. And I think that it then produces the fruit in the life of the individual believer and in the life of the local church and community. And, and even, even in times of, of historical nationwide revivals, you see those things spread and then it begins affecting other local churches. Yeah, well, there's a lot of people that I talk to, and I'm sure I'm sure there are people that were at Asbury at some point in the last two weeks that were there more as like spiritual pilgr- pilgrimage or whatever. I'm sure that was a thing. Uh, I've been in my area long enough to know that there were 100 percent people that went just for that. But there are all the conversations I've had with people basically have that uh, that what you're talking about, man. As far as it going back, it's really a uh, a um, sort of a strengthener of their faith of, you know, you know, God is, is doing something. I'm renewed. I'm rejuvenated. I'm reminded of how good he is. And then them taking that back in just to their daily lives with that, you know, so, I mean, this is a probably a terrible comparison, but this is the example that just came to mind. Like just a vacation. When you're doing the same thing mundane every day, when you go on vacation, you sort of relax, you sort of just you you come back to who you are <laughs> you know you remember your personality and then you go back and you know when you get back to work you're just you're a different whole different person because you've rested and you've you rejuvenated and it's a similar thing i think all the conversations i've had with people that they're excited and reminded about how good god is and how gracious he is and they they are really having those conversations and um, just again, that whole remembering your first love thing. I had a conversation with one of uh, the patrons that was there and we just talked about an hour ago. And that was one of the things that she said was, it was just a reminder of how good God is and just a strengthener of her faith. Um, that, you know, no, don't give up in your prayers. Don't give up in, uh, and all the things you are praying for, because, you know, he, he, I am moving, I am doing the things. Um, that you just don't see behind the scenes. So, I mean, that's, that, that was kind of thing. So, Josh, what do you think as far as wider church in reaction to something like this? What do you think effect-wise? Well, I, <clears throat> I think you're going to see people in churches wanting that in their church. Um, and I, I think that can tend to be problematic, that particular yeah. aspect of it. Um, because the Lord works how the Lord works. And it would just be, it'd be like asking, why is the church growing in China faster than it's growing in America right now? Well, that's how the Lord's working right now. Why is the church growing faster in Africa than it's growing in America? Because that's how the Lord's working. And he is working his divine plan to secure his, the, the Christ's bride. And we don't have any say in how he does that. And so we can want revival. We can pray for revival, Right. Um, it doesn't mean that it's going to occur in our churches and look like revivals that are happening around the world. It, it, and it doesn't have to, right? I think there's there's a <clears throat> the nature of the world we live in now with the internet and social media is so small and information travels so fast that that has become problematic for us just as a human species. 70 years ago, none of us probably would have heard about it at this point. Maybe a little bit. Maybe it would have been in a newspaper right? A hundred years ago, wouldn't definitely wouldn't have heard about it, right? It just, it would not have been on our radar to then compare how our churches are to that particular instance. But let's assume for a minute it is a real revival that the Lord's really working in all those people's lives and those lives are being changed. They're going to go into their churches and hopefully from there they are discipled and they, they do marry and they have children who they raise in the admonition and love of the Lord. And that faith multiplies generationally. Well, now you're going to start to have an effect in churches of churches that are God-centered and preaching the word of God. And maybe that leads to a national renewal of faith and a national revival. I mean, that's what we want. I think the the danger of skepticism is, I actually said this to my buddy Ty earlier, um, the danger of skepticism is when we go into the skepticism wanting to be right about the revival being wrong. I'm more concerned about saying, ah, it's not a real revival for these three reasons. And I'm more concerned about being right in my three reasons than I am about the possibility that the Lord's working on a campus instead of my church. And I think that's wrong. I think that's really dangerous. And that's not skepticism. That's not healthy skepticism at that point. That's that's being a cynic and being completely critical. We're called to be skeptics as Christians and to, to 
check things against scripture and to verify the spirits and all these things that we've been told to do, those are right and good. And nobody should say not to do them. And that's an effect right now that churches should be doing is healthy skepticism of what's going on, especially churches that are nearby and have these people coming in. They need to reach out to them. They need to make sure that they're getting in the word, that they're being discipled and maybe get some of that energy in their church. That's great. But they also need to be weighing and making sure that it is true and it is real. And there has to be a healthy balance and they can't go into that hoping that it's not real so that they can be justified in whatever fundy version of Christianity they adhere to. And they can be, you know, validated as they eat their tater tot casserole on Sunday. <laughs> no, I, I love the distinction there that you make as far as like what it looks like versus also not being so skeptical that you, you downplay the whole thing. I mean, because in reality, I mean, the thing is, I think some people unfortunately do define a revival by the jumping up and down and loud singing mm-hmm. and some sort of, you know, just very exuberant movement when that's not necessarily the case that is always going to manifest itself in. I mean, there, there have been, and this is a conversation I had with, with one of the, my friends at church is that I, I was driving home and kind of like decompressing everything. And I text him and he had, uh, the, the general gist of it was, I was like, it's not necessarily unique to there. Like I told, like we've had similar things at my church on a much smaller scale, which what I mean by that is just somebody standing up and testifying yep. about the goodness of God. Pastor has a sermon ready to go. They stand up just to testify about the goodness of God in their life. Then somebody else stands up and testifies about the goodness of God in their life. Somebody over here stands up and testifies about a struggle they're having, but how much faith and foundation and trust they have in the Lord. And you spend the entire church service probably usually longer because everybody has, I mean, it's just, in, it just keeps going. And essentially, I mean, again, I know the whole Asbury thing was very much defined by music, but the, the same idea being, it's just the praise of admonition of the Lord of how, how good he is and not necessarily defining it by, Oh, look at all these people singing, look at all these people coming. It, that's not necessarily a, uh, you know, the definition of a revival is everybody floods your town and everybody's jumping up and down and everybody's got a line outside your church. It could be very much just people, the humble repentance falling before the Lord and have a small church renewal. I mean, like you said, this is, that's the clincher on that social media thing you said. Really, if it wasn't for social media, it would have very much stayed a student revival of, of repentance and praise. And then it would have, you know, however long it would have went, it would have went. And then you would have read about it later in a history book. Uh, but the idea being that just be, uh, ah, man, okay, we have a half hour, so we'll get to this. So, <laughs> so let's, let's use this as sort of a, a bridge, right? So one of the things that I think, and I want to pick your guys' brain about, because me and Matt actually, I, we talked on while I was driving home that night. And one of the mm. things I mentioned to him uh, that I just couldn't get out of my head was that I think... Not everybody that was there, but I think some of the reason that some people went is because they saw all of that on their social media or maybe on the news of all these Christians gathering together and singing and worshiping very, very outwardly, very ecstatically. And they're like, I don't have that at my church and I want that. And the only way for me to get that is to go there or what they would have done previously is gone to like a winter jam or gone to a Christian concert because there, you know, no inhibitions. It's not my, you know, my dead lazy church basically is what they would probably say. And so I think a lot of that, uh, not again, not everybody's motivation in it, but I think maybe partially this was some people's motivation of like, I want that and that's the only place I can get it. So I'm going to go there. And my worry, and this is the two things I want to kind of, kind of, talk about here is one do you think that there is that that real desire that people have for their churches to be on fire for the lord not necessarily jumping up and down and doing all the thing but just really just this palpable we love jesus we want people to be saved and they're missing that but they saw it there and two do you think that this may make some people judge their church wrongly because it's not there and they want it to be there so matt what do you think first Yeah, I think that is or was the motivation uh, for some of those people. Maybe maybe a lot of them. I'm, I, I don't know. But just statistically, I would say a, a big number uh, because that seems to be what happens in most revivalist atmospheres. Because the reason that there are people from other churches 
usually coming to where you are is because they're trying to seek what they assume is there, but and also assuming that it's not where they are normatively. Uh, I guess I would respond to that by saying that it is available anywhere. Uh, you know, what's happened at Asbury is not unique in mm -hmm. experience or in energy or in location. It's something that is available to each believer in each community of faith, sometimes even to entire traditions. And so I think that this can be, you know, at the beginning I said these things can be good, but some of the effects can be bad because there is a difference between wanting a revival and experiencing a revival versus re wanting revivalism and producing revivalism. Because revivalism is the idea that you have to have this unique, one-time experience that is anchored to a particular minister or a particular person or a particular time and place. And so that, of course, yes, it does set you up in a bad type of emotionalism in the negative way. Um, what was the second part of your question? Oh, Just yeah. To, okay. yeah. We can make people look, look uh, yeah, down on their church. Um, yes, but if you have that experience, then start seeking the Lord and asking the Lord uh, to, to do a special work in you and in your local body. Uh, <laughs> take that time to speak the Lord, speak to your, your leadership at, at the church and say, you know, hey, can we, uh, you know, how, how can I pray for you? How can I pray for the church? Like if there's not a type of uh, like a prayer meeting, maybe before before church, I'm sure people probably pray before church, but like maybe if there was a prayer ministry where people gathered an hour before service on Sundays or before Wednesdays, uh, maybe that sort of just kind of dwindled. Maybe it got, maybe it dropped off during COVID and it's not been revamped. Like, you know, try to re-implement that in, in your church because you know, the, the secret ingredient to a revival, a true revival, is that there is no secret ingredient. You just, you know, you, you just, you, you, you pray, you, you worship God, you meet together, you celebrate in the sacrament, you preach the word, you repent, you do all of these things that are there, and... If you do these things in the way that they are set up and intended to be done, uh, I can't guarantee you that there will just that you'll have an Asbury revival at your church and your congregation where it lasts all day long for three weeks to a month. Um, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I, I, don't, I don't even know if my church could, could technically handle that <laughs> because just, I mean, it wear people out. I guess, you know, with Asbury University, there's a lot of people there, a lot of staff, a lot of students, and they got everybody right. involved. But, um, uh, you know, it's it, extremely tiring. And you may not get that, but I guarantee you that if you do those things in the right heart, with the right uh, disposition of spirit that God's God's blessing will will freely flow because that's the way He designed the church to operate. And so then it's not so much a one-time scheduled temporary revival, but it's more just a revival in which your local body of believers is is lifted up and begins to function in the way that that it should. Be. Yeah, for sure. Josh, what are your what are your opinions on that? So what were the two parts of the question again? I apologize. Oh, you're good. Uh, the <laughs> I forgot the first question. What, I forgot that... the first one. The second one was, do you think oh. I forget the first one? I 100% do. But do you think that um, some people might come away with this 
uh, with the idea that my church doesn't do this yeah. and therefore my church isn't, you know, it, it's, it's right. lacking in some way. Sure. Yeah. Do I think people are going to judge their churches? Yes. Yeah. Every day. <laughs> um, so what popped in my head while I was listening to Matt, um, it was the idea that, so uh, existentialism is real popular again today. That's kind of the primary driving philosophy behind all of Gen Z and everything that we see and interface with on a daily basis. And the basic idea behind that is that in order to be an authentic person, you have to experience life. You have to have certain experiences in order to be an authentic person. And this is why people that are pro-choice are okay with killing a baby outside of the womb because it hasn't experienced life and therefore doesn't have personhood. It hasn't achieved personhood because it hasn't had any experiences to be a person, right? That's a part of the root of that whole idea. And so that's a dangerous philosophy when you bring that into Christianity and say, you're not a Christian unless you have had these specific authentic experiences. Now, you got, we got to hold some things in tension here because there are experiences that are legitimate, right? When you come to Christ and you realize the weight of sin is taken off of you, that's an experience. You're, you're going to feel that, right? Um but you can't go chasing that feeling now, right? I mean, that you, everyone that's grown up in the church knows what that is. That's going to a winter retreat and getting saved and then going to summer camp and getting saved and then the winter retreat again and getting saved, right? And you're, you're just in this emotional cycle, having these experiences to authenticate who you are. The Christian pretty sure, life. Oh. Pretty sure you just named my entire youth group experience right there. Oh, yeah, I mean, me too, right? Like, um, and so I think that's, that's a dangerous philosophy that's out there and it's just creeping into our brains every day and so as people go to their churches and they think oh i'm not having this experience something's wrong with my church well, no no there's not oftentimes the christian life is just living for the lord on a daily basis right paul said to live quiet lives right just peaceable quiet lives take care of your family whatever situation you find yourself in at whatever age you have certain responsibilities and obligations. Fulfill them as Christ would have you fulfill them. That's the Christian life. And there are going to be moments of emotional highs. Those, those do happen. And they will occur as you study the word. Like, you know, just even in seminary, like seminary is a drudgery, man. It's so, so much work. And there will be days that I'm, I'm under immense pressure. You know, I've got you know, a job, I've got a family, and I'm writing a paper. And I'll be in the middle of studying some obscure scripture for some class, writing a, p a paper. And the next thing I know, I'm in tears reading scripture yeah, because Amos is moving. Like of all things, like when's the last time you read Amos, right? It's not even on the annual reading plan yet. That's not probably until like August or September. Like it's just an obscure scripture we don't read very often, but there's it's the word of God It's living and it's active and you will have those emotional responses. But if we think that we need those responses to validate us as Christians, that becomes problematic. And that's where you start to chase those experiences. And I would say that that is where um, a lot of, of charismatic beliefs go off the rails, like speaking in tongues, and especially as it's tied to, you have to have this, have had this specific experience to validate your salvation. That's, that's just not what we see in scripture. And that's, I would even say that me, I'm, I've, I've shifted a little more to not quite so much of a cessationist. We're just waiting for Matt's, Matt's grin there. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> right? Make, so I, make so sure this gets like, uploaded and recorded somewhere. <laughs> We've entered a new dispensation is what's, what's happened. It's... <laughs> gotcha. Okay. So there's, there's two we'll things here. I've lost. <laughs> There, there's two things I want to cover that are both in the comment section that I think are, are good questions in relation to this. So the first one is from Andrew, and he says, I guess the question that I have is then, is there a role uh, for a, quote, spiritual pep rally type of experience in the church when paired with spiritual discipleship and engagement of our faith? Is there a time that maybe that that is a, a sort of a needed thing, or um, is that maybe maybe not a thing? I'll give mine at the end, but Matt, you want to kind of, is there, is there a role maybe for sort of a, a time where you maybe change it up and do a spiritual pep rally? Yeah. I mean, I don't see harm in whatever we want to call it, like a spiritual pep rally, as long as the intentions and <clears throat> the focus of that 
are right. If the intention is to just spark people up, like that's the only kind of gasoline that's going into their tanks that's going to give them the energy to get through to the next time you have a spiritual pep rally, then, then no, that's that would that's extremely unhealthy, extremely detrimental to someone's to someone's growth, to someone's lived Christian experience and life. But if it's something like in go back to Revelation three, uh, when Jesus is talking to the church in Sardis, he said, I, "I've heard that you have a name, that you are alive." but you are actually dead, and he, he gives an imperative there. He says, become, uh, it's like become watchful, but it's like the idea of essentially become revived, because he says, you know, you were dead, so therefore become alive, and strengthen the remaining things, uh, because if you don't, then those things which are still alive are going to die along along with you, because you're, you're in a state of stagnation. And so I think that if Jesus can say that to the church as artist, then there may be times in the life of a believer or in the life of a particular church body other than Sardis when a spiritual pep rally is is needed. Gotcha. Josh, what what I mean your thoughts. I know you said you don't really do revivals in a Baptist church, but I mean what do you think? Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, I, so I never grew up with those. Um, the Bible church that I attend now, <clears throat> they don't really do revivals or things like that. But um, about, about a, what was this, February? about a month ago, a young couple in our church in their thirties uh, were having their, I think it's their second child. Um, the day before the child was due, she thought something was wrong, went to the doctor and lo and behold, the child's dead. So she had to go through labor to deliver a dead baby. Um, and a couple weeks later, they decided they didn't want to do a funeral. Instead, they picked the night during the week and they had a worship night at our church. And the whole, I didn't, no, I didn't go, but our whole church gathered, not the whole church. I'd say a lot of people gathered and they went and we have a little room where the, we do those things with it. just just an easy self-contained sound system. And they had a worship night and they went and praised the Lord and sang and, and, and had an emotional, I imagine it's emotional, right? We're, we're here, they're here, they're singing to the Lord. And the only reason they're gathered is because a child was born dead. So yeah, that's, there's a time and a place for that. And that's a place for that couple to then interact with the body of Christ and be comforted. That's a time and a place for everybody to remember that the Lord is in control, right? Like there's, there is definitely a time and a place for those things. And then everyone still went to church on Sunday. And what was that church service like? Did you have a different? Did they have a different perspective on it? Right? Did did Scripture have a, a different tinge on it? Right? Were their hearts primed for worship because they took time out of their day to worship the Lord, who saw fit for that child to not come into this world? Yeah, absolutely. There's a time and a place for it uh, when it's along with uh, spiritual disciplines and, and discipleship. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Well, I think, I mean, the, the cool thing is you guys both described basically the, uh, the opposite thing. So there's, you know, there's churches that will go with the, and uh, I'm telling you, huh, if you ain't, are you not helping me preach church? Uh, and you know, that whole, like get you all riled up part where it's like, you're not participating. So you're not Jesus -y enough versus the, the, the very humble entering into worship in times where it doesn't make sense to worship, but because you're a believer, you want to give thanks to God. And I think that is, I mean, that's the night and day difference of this whole gathering, this whole, this idea of getting together for what? Well, are we trying to pump ourselves up to, to, to have enough life in us to, to praise Jesus? Or is it sort of our natural inclination that in those hard moments or in those joyful moments or in those trying moments to come before the Lord in praise and, and joy? And I think that's, I don't think we could have set up a better dichotomy there in regards to, you know, scheduling a time, getting people all pumped up, telling them to invite their friends when they wouldn't normally invite their friends versus gathering together with other believers to come before God. And I mean, that's, uh, it's very similar. I mean, again, not to go back to the whole Asbury thing, because I know we're just kind of using it as a jumping board here, but talking to the student that goes there, that's what that basically was. It was, it was students that were coming together to, 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 to pray to, for humble hearts, to engage with their community, to love people like 
Jesus loved them and they knew they hadn't been doing that. And so entering into that time to do that now, it obviously became something entirely different uh, over time as more people showed up, but it was really that, that natural, like, we know we're not right before you. We want to be right before you. And then that the sort of praise that comes out of understanding how gracious God is uh, and other people kind of latching onto that a little bit. So, I mean, I think that's a perfect dichotomy of like kind of churned up revivalism versus natural God revive my heart in these moments and put me in a right headspace. Um, that's I think that's a perfect sort of dichotomy. The last question, I know we have like 10 minutes left, but there was one here I really wanted to get to from uh, Tom. Tom had said, from childhood to adulthood through membership and deep involvement in multiple churches, I've never been actively discipled. Now, I know that seems like it's disconnected from everything we've talked about, but really when we're talking about revivalism, one of the, the things I talked about in my longer video about visiting is when you do have those moments, when you have, like, even if it's a churned up revival, maybe God will see fit to save people through that. Or even in those moments of deep hardship, there's this understanding that maybe I'm not where I need to be. And Lord, please bring me that point. I mean, what, what, I, I talk about it a lot, but I think in revivalism, typically we don't think about discipleship being connected to that, but how big of a role do you, and how important a role do you think it is? I mean, so using again, Asbury as an example in a jumping board, but local churches as well, whenever we have these very God, for whatever reason, touches in those moments, like how important do you think it is to then disciple those people well through those those moments? I mean, I know this is sort of a softball question, but Matt, I mean, how, how wisely do we handle that? I think that the efficiency with which a local church disciples people is the good litmus test and evaluation for how authentic a revival has been because if you have someone who attends a revival service and they become emotional whether they 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 weep or they clap their hands or they you know jump up and down or whatever it may be and let's say they do go to the altar and they pray they run the aisles they just run the aisles yeah or or in my trees we don't just run the aisles we also run the backs of the pews which is why we had to get those, you know, like chairs, the stackable chairs, because that finally put a stop to it because you can't run on the back of the chairs. Just uh, fall know, over. Just, yeah, it, 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 was, it was really bad. People learned their lesson quickly on that. Uh, but, oh man, I just dropped something back there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> you know, back to, back to what I was saying, uh, if you have someone who comes and exhibits those things and then you connect that person and want to begin putting them through a, a process of discipleship and they either ign you know, never come back to church, ignore your calls and your messages, and they, they show no change or what, what have you. I mean, that, that's, of course, just one particular individual. But let's say if the majority of people who are having these experiences um, end up not getting plugged into the local church. There is no notable uh, change or, or, or desire. That would definitely be a big uh, you know, a way to evaluate, say, well, maybe this wasn't actually an authentic, an authentic experience. And then if you also have a church or churches or traditions, which is usually characteristic of my own tradition, where once people are there to have this experience, like nobody even really cares to disciple anybody else because literally it's just the experience. You say you just have that experience and boom, you're there. And so they just hope to have more experiences next week. And there's not really any kind of like a process of discipleship, whether on the congregational scale or on the individual scale or, or anything. So that's, that's definitely a deficiency that I can see in my Gotcha. So, I mean, it plays into what Josh already said, which is your basically discipleship is chasing the experience next time. That's, that's what discipleship is. What's your next experience you had? How good was it? Did that do the last one? Gotcha. So Josh, what do you, what do you think about, I mean, again, discipleship in relation to these type of revivals, this type of thing, how should, how should that be done and measured? So I, I relate to what Tom said, 
right? From childhood to adulthood, <laughs> through membership and deep involvement in multiple churches, I've never been disi- actively discipled. Me too. Um, if we look at discipleship as this very specific one-on-one mentoring where you meet with your disciple or, and, you know, they're taking you through specific aspects of the faith and how to do things. I've never had that. I have had a lot of really faithful Sunday school teachers because I grew up in the church. So Sunday school teachers, youth leaders, youth pastors, people that poured a lot of time and energy into me over the years. And I still get that now, just not in as much of a formal setting. Um, as it relates to revival, I think uh, there's, you, you know, my church has somewhere between seven and 800 people show up on a Sunday, not counting kids. Uh, we have six staff pastors. How do they disciple that? right? That's a one to 100 ratio. And so that's, that's a tough thing, right? And so without getting into ecclesiology and all of that stuff, things have been put into place to try to create a network of leadership of trusted people who have been uh, proven by the fruit in their lives that they're trustworthy believers to go out and actively engage everyone in the church, right? So it So then there's, you know, adult Bible fellowships. And then within those, there are leadership teams and they are out actively looking and engaging with people in small groups and visitors uh, and trying to communicate those things. As that relates to revival, um, I think we're kind of getting back to what we were talking about in the beginning. Um, the extent to which we are able to do those things in the believers in our churches is the extent to which we may experience that kind of revival should that happen for us. We may not need that, right? Like it, it seems like these kinds of revivals, let's just assume for the, for a moment that this is absolutely 100% of the Lord, no skepticism needed. It's, it's him working. It doesn't mean that it's needed everywhere, right? If a church is faithfully doing these things every single day and people are coming to Christ and they are growing in the Lord weekly, right? And family, right? The husbands are taking responsibility and they're teaching the Bible to their children and to their wives and all of those things are occurring. What revival is needed at that point? People are living faithfully. Um, Maybe it was needed there and we don't know why he chose Asbury. Who cares? It, right? If we just assume that it's it's all legit, who cares? It's happening. Let's assume that it's real. Hopefully then they do go to those churches. So those churches that are in the local area, they need to be attentive to that. They need to have some sort of an, an understanding of what's been occurring and who might start showing up. And if they have a bunch of college students start to show up or even just local neighborhood people who somehow were there, who, who were involved and, you know, new believers or had a renewal of whatever, those people are going to seek out a church more than life. If they do, the churches have to be ready for that. If you're not ready for it, if you're within like a 10 mile radius of Asbury, you're not ready for it, you're wrong. <laughs> like you got to get on your game and be ready for these people to come to church and start saying, you know, that's great that you had that experience. We're really, really happy about that. Here's a Bible, right? Like you need to start reading it. Uh, and that experience personally, it's, it's going to continue, but maybe not in as sensational of a way and start trying to plug them in, not just into discipling relationships. Those are important too, but also within a group setting so that they become a part of the body of Christ. And they're not just tied to a singular person to where they've had this singular event where they were kind of anonymous. Maybe they interacted with a person and now they have one local contact at their church that they're you know discipling with. They really got to get in and participate in corporate worship. And this, that's where there has to be this transition of these kinds of revivals seem to be very uh, individual centric in a sense, like they're all there together, but they're all having their own kind of emotional response and interaction with the Lord. That needs a transition to a corporate one also. And I think that that's an emphasis that's largely missed in churches today. We come together for corporate worship, but everyone even then is focused on themselves. They're focused on their worship, how they're singing, you know, whatever level they're raising their hands in worship and having that that experience. You need to remember that there are people around you and that you are corporately worshiping. There's a time and a place for that individual stuff. But when you're together as a corporate body, you're ministering to the people beside you with your singing and with all of your actions. And that all has to kind of be considered. And those are all things churches have to be considering uh, as these people are coming in. And those are all things that churches have to be considering 
should a revival ever spontaneously occur in their church. But I think churches that are on their game and doing those things and people are just living for the Lord, I don't think they need revival. Yeah, no, no, no. Good point. Yeah. If you're just doing those things, like, I mean, the things that Matt mentioned before, the things that you've mentioned as far as that goes, you're going to really have a continuous reviving anyway, this growth in the Lord, the right. sanctification. Um, and sometimes I'm afraid, and we don't have, we're going to end it right here, but I think uh, sometimes churches and people may seek out that very big, huge thing and miss out on the very work that God's doing very ground level in their local congregation. And you're going to miss the whole forest for the trees. Uh, yep. in, in doing that. So hopefully guys, if this was helpful to you, make sure you leave a like, make sure you leave a con a comment, contact. I don't know. Smash the like button. You know, the things, you know, the things we'll talk to you next Tuesday. Bye.